Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am so excited about this lecture. What we are going to do today has never been done before anywhere. In fact, I don't think I've prepared for lectures with so much time and intention. I have 30 <laughs> pages around me right now for this lecture. Why do I have that? I've spoken about GMOs a thousand times in 45 countries, but we're doing something different here. We are going to take one disease category at a time and discuss the question whether GMOs and Roundup are contributing to that disease, causing it, exacerbating it, etc. Now, we're going to do this in a way that's different than most or perhaps any type of lecture you've seen because this is designed really to be cut up into pieces so that when it hits the social media, there's one short a uh, video just about metabolic disorders, one short video about digestive disorders, one about reproductive, so that you and the audience can share it and send it around and make it viral. A lot of the real truth about health videos are going viral. There was one that was released with me last week or last month, it's got over 175,000 views. So what we're going to do with uh, these experts that I'm so honored to be with, uh, Drs. Michelle, Perro and Stephanie Seneff is we're going to introduce a disease, introduce the evidence, and then talk about what could possibly be causing it from GMOs and Roundup. Then we're gonna to go to a new disease and some of what you're gonna hear is repetitious because remember when it gets cut up by Ben and sent around the world, they won't have the benefit of what they just heard when we talked about cancer, when we're now talking about uh, atopic diseases. So you're going to hear some repetition, but bear with us. You're going to learn it better. And the people who are going to hear about it are going to learn it for the first time. And they may actually make the decision to go organic, to get rid of the GMOs and the Roundup. So I want to say that the, I love the introduction to both of you, Stephanie and Michelle. You are heroes, uh, rock stars in this. You have seen the... Um, plausible causative pathways. You've seen what's happening, uh, Stephanie, in the deep research that you're doing in the big data, Michelle, in your actual practice. And so we get to pour your experiences and wisdom into this. Anything you want to say before we take this for a test drive? I'd say let's rock it, Jeffrey. We're ready. All right. All right. All right. So we're going to start with digestive disorders. Here we go. Are your digestive problems caused by GMOs and Roundup? There's a lot of digestive problems that are plaguing people in the United States. And thanks to Drs. Nancy Swanson and Stephanie Seneff, we have some correlational evidence showing a rise in both the increased use of Roundup on genetically and on soy and corn and inflammatory bowel disease. This is correlation, it doesn't prove causation, but it shows a remarkable correlation, which we will then discuss to see, is it possible that inflammatory bowel disease is being exacerbated in the US population by the use of Roundup? We also have adjusted, age-adjusted deaths due to intestinal infection going up very closely in the slope of the increased use of glyphosate applied to soy and corn. And finally, peritonitis going up as well. So I could tell you as, as a way of introduction that I asked people at 150 lectures, including about two dozen medical conferences, how many people, what do people get better from when they switch to non-GMO and largely organic diets? And the number one most common result was always digestive disorders because someone would say, you know, GERD or acid reflux or inflammatory bowel. I said, who else notices a digestive disorder improvement? And that was always huge numbers. In fact, we then surveyed 3,256 people who got better from 28 different conditions. And sure enough, digestion was at the top 85.2% described an improvement when they switched to non-GMO and organic. And it wasn't just a small improvement. 80% of those that reported had at least a significant improvement, nearly gone or completely 
recovered. So this was big. So I would like to hear first from you, Michelle, you've been doing pediatrics for close to 40 years. So you were around before GMOs and Roundup were introduced. Did you see an increase in digestive or disorders soon after GMOs were introduced in the late 1990s? And have you found that changing the diet back so that people do not, so that children do not have GMOs and Roundup in their diet can undo some of that damage? Uh, yes, Jeffrey. So it was, you're right, 40, 40 years, hard to, hard to imagine practicing. I am a frontline doc, meaning I actually take care of kids in offices and I actually put my hands on them and examine them. I know, kind of shocking that mm -hmm. I touch, touch the children. And what happened is around the early 2000s, all of a sudden, you know, being an, an astute pediatrician, asking parents questions, listening to parents, that I started seeing sicker and sicker children. And remember what we as pediatricians do largely has to do, especially with babies, eating, pooping and sleeping. I spend most of my life talking about those three issues. So food and poop are a huge part of my conversation almost daily. So in the early 2000s, yes, indeed, chronic diseases across the board, let's hone in just on gut issues or gastrointestinal or GI for short. Everything was going up, chronic abdominal pain, in kids, that's the number one pain complaint in children. Constipation, um, a third of kids now are reporting pooping issues, alternating with diarrhea, known as IBS in adults. Kids with reflux, which means their food comes up in the back of their throats and many parents are unaware because the kids think it's normal. So when I ask the kids, hey, does your food come back in your throat? And then you have to swallow it back down and they say, yeah, all the time. And the parents mm -hmm. go, what? <laughs> so reflux is on the rise and bloating tummies. I have toddlers who look like they're five months pregnant, big bloated tummies, and we can go on. Then start mucking around with the diet. And the first thing I do is put all the kids in our organic diet. A lot of parents are say, there's no way that this can be. I'd say, you do the experiment. You're, you're in a four, you're a four family members, see what happens. And lo and behold, some kids, it was really quick, three days, longer for most, about four weeks, and the overall majority begin to get better. Varies, depends on what we're dealing with, of course, but not only the kids get better, but their family members get better because you don't give little Susie a kale salad and everyone else is eating pepperoni pizza. That doesn't work. So the whole family has to change their diet and lo and behold, Oh my gosh, everyone's not running to the you know, supermarket to buy laxatives and you know, um, antacids, everyone felt better. You know, your experience when you talked about the five months pregnant reminded me of a photo in our film, Secret Ingredients, where the families switched to organic and the bloating and the large stomachs went away, the constipation went away, the digestive issues, the moods as a result in the children. Stephanie, you've been examining the um, chemical properties of glyphosate and its modes of action in the body. What would you say would be some of the reasons why Roundup may be contributing to the problems of digestion in the United States? It's a huge list and it's hard to know how to say it quickly. <laughs> I have a whole chapter in my book on the gut. In fact, that was a very difficult chapter to write. I, I, re I read an enormous number of papers. There's so much coming out on the gut and all the different correlations with different species and different diseases. It's very hard to untangle it all and get the story straight, but I feel like I did in my book. And it's, um, it's an astonishing, uh, all the things. It's like so many. It starts, of course, with the fact that glyphosate preferentially kills the, the beneficial bacteria. The bacteria have this enzyme, EPSP synthase, in this, in this biological pathway called the shikimate pathway. And um, we don't have that enzyme, and that's why it's claimed that glyphosate is safe. But in fact, it's not safe because these are, our microbes have the enzyme, use the enzyme to make aromatic amino acids, which are essential amino acids because our bodies can't make them. Let me, but let me, let me unpack that just for a second. So Monsanto has been bragging for years that their herbicide kills plants because it blocks their pathway that we don't have. And they're being sued right now because they knew all along that bacteria that's inside us need that pathway in order to produce the precursors to the happy molecules, the happy, the happy serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine. 
So that's been confirmed that the gut bacteria, when it's blasted with Roundup, can disable that function. Go ahead, Stephanie. Right. And so, and then studies on which microbes were most affected by glyphosate found that lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, which are really important, you know, pro they're the healthy uh, m m microbes that we need to be able to, the baby needs in order to be able to digest the milk. It needs these microbes and those microbes are really getting hit hard by glyphosate. Whereas there's other species like salmonella and clostridia that are robust against glyphosate. So you get that imbalance where these pathogens are overgrowing in the gut. You even get an overgrowth of yeast because of the microbes being reduced. The bacteria are beginning reduced in number of the yeast overgrowth. Also the yeast feasts on the foods, the sugars that we're, um, we're unable to digest these foods properly so that they end up um, causing this yeast overgrowth. And um, which is part of the problem. And then you get this uh, SIBO is quite interesting as, uh, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is quite uh, becoming an epidemic. And that one's interesting to me. And also that goes with the uh, diarrhea and constipation, the cycles of diarrhea and constipation and all the bloating, all the stuff. It's, um, there was a woman who tried to commit suicide by drinking glyphosate. And, and there was a report about her, a paper that was published. And one of the things they found striking was that it paralyzed her gut. It completely paralyzed it. And, um, and that doesn't surprise me. One of the things is serotonin. Serotonin is important for, for getting the, the gut to move the, the feces down the tube. But also um, myosin is a, is a contractile protein that's very important in the gut to push things through. Myosin has critical dependencies on glycine residues that can get disrupted by glyphosate and cause that molecule not to contract. Quite amazing. There was a study that showed a single glycine in that, a critical glycine in that protein. If it gets replaced by something else, actually alanine, which is very similar to glycine, um, the, 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 pro the, the protein can only contract at 1% capacity just with that right, small so, change. So what we're seeing is we're, let's gonna, we're gonna make line these up, okay? First of all, we mentioned that glyphosate, which is the chief poison in Roundup. So everyone knows Roundup is something that is not just used on lawns, it's sprayed on food. It's sprayed on most genetically engineered crops. It's sprayed on a lot of the grains and beans in the United States. It's spray, it's, you can find it in wine, in beer, in orange juice because of how it's used chemically. And, and so we're, we're and infant formula. Thank mm -hmm. you, Michelle. Infant right. formula. You have to be the the baby whisperer. You speak on behalf of the babies <laughs> in the next generation. Just dive in when you sp speak when they can. So it turns out it's not only patented as an herbicide, but it's patented also as an antimicrobial, as an antibiotic. But it, like no other antibiotic that I know about, searches and destroys the good stuff, not the bad stuff. Right. And this was actually shown by Kieran Krishnan, an expert in the microbiome, who took a human model and applied Roundup. And sure enough, dramatic negative changes, dramatic negative changes in the microbiome when exposed to Roundup. And I asked him about what could those changes do in terms of digestive, or for example, inflammatory bowel. And he has a number of things, which I'll share in a moment. But so we've talked about the changes in the gut bacteria, which can decimate and change the population. And you talked about the changes in the motility or the ability for it to contract. So if it's just paralyzed, that's going to be a problem with digestion. And that's SIBO because the bacteria get backed up too. I mean, the whole thing isn't moving through. And so you get all this food up high that's uh, allowing the bacteria to grow there because it's uh, in the small intestine, you're getting overgrowth of bacteria in that SIBO condition. And then of course the diarrhea comes in. The kids are constipated, they're constipated, they're constipated. And finally they get all this water and then it just gushes out. It's a sort of reaction to the constipation to try to wash the food out because you can't contract the, the muscles to get it out. So you have to find another way. So it's this constant cycle of constipation and diarrhea. That Is that what see. you're seeing Michelle as well? Um, I am. And, um, and, you know, there's also this all sorts of related issues we're seeing kids where they still withhold and then they get blocked up and then they get this leakage around there. And that's a big problem now. And then they get the mood disorders related around it because of the gut bacteria imbalances, which we'll talk about later and then affect their mood. So it becomes cyclical. I also want to add just when you were talking about the microbiome and these gut disorders, which is the leading cause, um, you know, the Roundup is way more toxic. Glyphosate is a nightmare and it's horrific and causes chronic toxicity. But the 
adjuvants, the POEA, the other stuff in Roundup, these emulsifiers, they're surfactants, they break down fats. Emulsifiers have an equally destructive effect on the microbiota. There's a lot of literature now on emulsifiers found in all sorts of processed food products. So when we talk about going organic, we talk about removing processed foods to get rid of those emulsifiers because Roundup has a dual nasty action of both the glyphosate, which is a um, antimicrobial, and the emulsifying action of the surfactant, which is an antimicrobial effect. So yeah. both. And right, say, and, those, and those surfactants allow glyphosate to get into the cell too. They promote the uptake of glyphosate. So that's really important too. And I think the processed foods have so many chemicals in them. And I think it's really important to emphasize eating whole foods as well as eating organic foods. You know, I was talking to farmers who took animals off of GMOs that have been sprayed with Roundup and they noticed a dramatic change in the digestive condition. Uh, Ib Pedersen from Denmark, mm -hmm. he changed, you both know him or we both know of him. He, he changed the diet to non-GMO soy for his pigs and didn't tell his farmhand. And about uh, soon after the, the farmhand came and said, you changed the, the feed. And Ib said, uh-oh, what happened? <laughs> and he said, no more diarrhea in the piglets. Mm. They had intractable, uncontrollable diarrhea for two years. It was killing a lot of the piglets. And within a day or so, they were not having diarrhea. And I interviewed the farmers having this experience at the same time I went to a practitioner who was talking their patients, interviewing their patients about IBD and IBS. And it was like talking about the same thing, only they were using different terms in the humans as the animals. And what was interesting about the animal study is they didn't shift to organic. They, uh, they didn't shift to non-processed foods. So it really, it was a, an easier conclusion to draw. But when you start looking at some of the research, there's so much evidence. I can, I can totally understand, Stephanie, why there's too much to put in the digestive chapter. I wrote an article that was peer reviewed and published in the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine and gathered all the ways that GMOs and Roundup could contribute to disorders of the gut. And it was quite a list. So I wanna share with you now what Kieran Christian said about, the, about inflammatory bowel research and what he found about the microbial community inside humans. So he said in a very large scale uh, paper on irritable bowel disease published in 2017, they compared people who had IBD with those that didn't. And they found that those that did had really low diversity in the microbiome. And when he applied Roundup to the human model for the microbiome, there was a dramatic reduction in the biodiversity. Diversity is so important in the health of the microbiome. So that was one thing. Second, short chain fatty acids, mm. which are produced by the microbiome, are very important. When you have low short chain fatty acids, irritable bowel is very common. And that was driven dramatic decrease in short chain fatty acids. The only thing he did different was add Roundup to the gut. In addition, there's some keystone strains. There's one whose name I'm going to butcher, uh, Fecalobacterium prosnitsi. <laughs> Maybe you can pronounce it better. All right, no. I, when, when I interview him, I just call it Dr. F. I say, he's a, it's a superhero, we're just gonna call it Dr. F. Well, that's well established to protect against inflammatory bowel and it is driven down because of the Roundup. There's also an increase in ammonia for a number of reasons. And it's interesting that GMOs alone, even without Roundup, have been linked to an increase in pneumonia, in ammonia. And ammonia is an inflammatory agent in the bowel, and it's very toxigenic to the liver, and it screws up the metabolic functions of all sorts of micro, microbials. And there's a rise in pH. Now, when there's a rise in pH, the digestive enzymes fall apart. So now they can't digest the food, which increases the ammonia, et cetera, et cetera. So just based on what he saw in the human microbiome exposed to Roundup gave all these indicators for inflammatory bowel. So I'm gonna go back to both of you. We'll start with Stephanie. Give another, one other piece about why Roundup might be causing digestive, and then I'll throw it back to you, Michelle, and we'll talk about some of the research 
of GMOs in Roundup causing digestive disorders. Go ahead. Yeah, and I talked about both the ammonia and the um, acid um, going up, the pH going up. That's really very interesting. I found some data on looking at uh, the guts of children way back when, before glyphosate, and that the uh, pH was much lower consistently across the population then than it is now. Uh, and that is the ammonia, and that is the consequence of the uh, proteins not getting digested. Glyphosate was found, Anthony Samsel ordered up um, samples of trypsin, pepsin, and lipase from a chemistry lab, and he tested them for glyphosate. They were from a pig, they were sourced from a pig, and they all three had high levels of glyphosate in them. I think glyphosate is getting into those digestive enzymes and messing up their ability to work. And so the, um, so the body actually can't digest the proteins. The, 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 the enzymes that are supposed to digest the proteins don't work correctly, and also the fats. And so both of them become problematic. When the proteins don't get digested in the upper gut, they end up as peptide sequences in the lower gut, you know, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the, the large bowel. And that's where you have these microbes breaking down those proteins and turning amino acids into ammonia because amino acids have nitrogen. So that's how you get this excess ammonia, which also raises the pH because ammonia has a very high pH. And then acetate is, is underrepresented. That's one of those short chain fatty acids, a butyrate, acetate, and propionic, pro, pro, propionate, which I always have trouble saying. Those three are so crucial. And those are produced by the gut microbes from the roughage. These are things that we don't normally digest. Um, and that if that's messed up too, then you've got sort of the roughage becomes... Um, harsh because it's now being broken down by the by the microbes into those short chain amino acids and the butyrate is absolutely essential for providing food for the gut uh, lining the the cells in the um, in the large intestine love butyrate that's their favorite food and they depend upon the microbes to produce a supply of butyrate and when they don't have enough butyrate bad things happen you get the leaky gut situation and inflammatory gut and all those problems um, because those um, cells are not being well fed by the butyrate that's not being produced by the microbes. There's just a, a lot of things. A study was done recently that showed that glyphosate causes leaky gut. And that was also because of these undigested proteins, which end up irritating the gut and cause an overproduction of a protein called zonulin. And zonulin actually opens up the gut barrier. So when you have these undigested proteins and the leaky gut, those peptides can leak past the gut barrier and get into the general circulation and the immune cells get very upset when they see that. They see these foreign proteins wandering around the blood. They produce antibodies to those proteins. And when they do that, those antibodies can become autoantibodies attacking human cells through this process called molecular mimicry, where the uh, human protein has a sequence that resembles a sequence that was in the original peptide from a food source that didn't get broken down. That's the whole gluten intolerance thing. I mean, I think the whole epidemic in gluten intolerance is a consequence of the gluten not being properly digested, the gluten molecules getting out into the circulation, causing an immune reaction, and then causing an immune attack on human proteins through this molecular mimicry process. Certainly when we talk about digestion, we need to talk about leaky gut and also this autoimmune disease issue that's on the rise. Michelle, What's your, both from clinical experience and your extensive knowledge of research, uh, where do you want to take it up in terms of the gut? You want to pick it up from the Arpad Pustai research and the leaky gut research? Pick it, pick your poison. Oh, so much. <laughs> um, that was a great segue from Stephanie's comments. Um, I'll pick it up in terms of this inflammatory bowel disease, because prior to maybe 15, 20 years ago, we didn't see a lot of inflammatory bowel disease in kids, and now it's on the rise. That's Crohn's, also ulcerative colitis, and what I'm seeing particularly even in babies is early signs of colitis, where they have mucus in the stools. Mucus is a not a normal finding, and what we do know is that depleted tryptophan has been found in, in patients mm -hmm. with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. And as we know, is that's where indeed glyphosate inhibits in the production of those aromatic amino acids, such as tryptophan, which has been found to be very depleted in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So it's really important. We cannot make those amino acids. Some we can make, some we can't. Those aromatic amino acids where glyphosate blocks, the shikimate pathway, which Stephanie referred to before, are key and crucial for the production for so many functions in the body and, and particularly in the hormones that control mood, like depression. And we can talk about that later and that's called serotonin. So. I wanna get back to babies for a second. Why is that? Because the cutting edge of research as Kieran will say, and Stephanie is the microbiota. 
within the first three years of life, you are able to manipulate and alter your microbiota. After about 890 days, that's no longer possible. You might have a little bit of wiggle room. I've read anywhere up to 30% where you can change it. I'm not sure if that's true or not, because there's a lot we don't know about the microbiome. So what's set up for baby in those first three years is key. And what you feed baby, if the baby's not having breast milk, they will not get enough of the microbiome from mom if they're fed formula. Even if you add it, it's not enough. Babies from 100 years ago, their fecal smears look like a monoculture of a type of beneficial bacteria called bifidobacterium. And we know that glyphosate-based herbicides target these acid-loving bacteria like bifido, like lactobacilli. You need this bifidobacterium phantis, that's the name, to lower the pH of the poop. When you lower the pH of the intestine and the poop, that prevents the growth of pathogens. This is a life-saving, life-protecting, nourishing aspect of nourishment for baby by the, what's in the poop via vaginal birth, passage through the, um, the canal, breastfeeding, and formula, not quite good enough. We do it sometimes, but just to understand, if you have to use formula, you have to use organic because there's glyphosate. And if you do a soy formula that's not organic, there are GMOs in glyphosate in a formula, which just blows my mind. So you want to protect the baby's microbiota. Um, and that microbiome, as we know, is important for detoxification, immune health, production of vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. And we can go into that further. And so you want to create this balanced, robust microbiota. When you check kids now, when you check adults now, and you actually do an assay and look at the composition of their stool, you find a loss of diversity you find high levels of pathogens or potential pathogens. You find losses of digestive enzymes. You find markers, early markers of inflammation that are like a crystal ball for who's gonna go on to develop autoimmune disease. And all that info is right in the stool. That is I well wanna, said, thank you. I wanna pick up uh, where you left off, Stephanie, on the, on the leaky gut and the inflammatory, and because leaky gut, there was an interesting, a uh, paper by the Harvard professor Fasano, who his art, his title of his paper was that all disease begins in the leaky gut, all disease. And so we don't have to be talking about all, all these other diseases. We just have to talk about the leaky gut. I remember interviewing Zach Bush and seeing a video of human cells that when they, he, he put in some glyphosate and they split apart. Yeah, that was amazing. And, and, and you could watch them go apart. So um, the, the interesting thing is in that video, there was no microbiome. It was just the, just the relationship between glyphosate and the cells. But we also know, as you said, the, the short chain fatty acids, the butyrate is important to build that mucosal layer. And Kieran Krishnan verified that that butyrate and the other two short chain fatty acids are all reduced. So now we end up with leaky gut. Now, leaky gut is linked to so many things. Uh, one of them is allergies. And when we interviewed people and the 3,256 people who reported getting better on 28 different conditions, the majority, just over 50%, said that they improved in food allergies and sensitivities. In fact, it wasn't just a small improvement, 76% of those who said that they got an improvement was at least significant or nearly gone or completely recovered, 76, three quarters. Wow. And I talked to um, one clinician in Chicago, went to her office, interviewed her patients. She said, yeah, allergies often three to seven days. Wow. So I wanna talk about leaky gut. First, let's do the evidence, the clinical evidence, and then over to you, Stephanie, for some more details on the biochemistry. Michelle, are you testing for leaky gut? Are you finding correlation with the diet? What happens when that gets cleaned up and is it related to the allergies? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I, uh, so what I tell now, where I am now, even since I wrote the book, is that just about every kid I see now has a leaky gut. They have two things, leaky gut and dysbiosis, an imbalanced microbiota. That's sort of like a given. How am I seeing it? How do I know? 
Well, it comes in the form of food intolerances. And so what's happening is all the kids are passing these proteins through um, at their, their little zonulin soldiers are not working properly. The food's passing through before it's incompletely broken down. Immune system standing by, they mount an immune response. This is called chronic inflammation. How do we know that clinically? Even if I don't test and I do, well, they can't tolerate gluten. They can't tolerate dairy. Those are big proteins that are getting incompletely broken down that also have an effect on brain function, right? So food, remember, affects your brain function. Everyone knows caffeine has an effect on your brain function. So food, these food chemicals are indeed that they're food chemicals. Food is an, a, a powerful uh, chemical mediator. So we see kids who... It used to be just occasional peanuts. It's every food category now where kids are sensitive and the common foods, which kids usually eat, which are basically carbs, dairy, soy, egg, off the chart sensitive. So this is where it gets tricky, Jeffrey, because this is where we argue with allergists. They say, well, it's not a true allergy because it's not mediated by um, an immunoglobulin, uh, immunoglobulin called IgE. So it's not a real allergy. Mm. This is where I disagree. What we see are elevations in other antibodies such as IgG, immunoglobulin G, and IgA, immunoglobulin A. When you look at, when you measure their blood, they have increased elevators of these antibodies. When you change their diets, both to organic and you have to do food eliminations or remove the offending agents, those numbers go down and their symptoms get better. I just don't wanna see a normal lab report and the patient died. I want to correlate it, oh, the lab's getting better, the kid is better. How do I know? Their gut feels better. Their mood is better. Their growth improves. You know, they're overall, they're overall feeling better. Their sleep is better. And it's mostly mood related. Kids are cranky when they have chronic inflammation. They don't feel well. It affects their brain. There's something called the gut brain axis. It's mediated, mediated via something called the enteric nervous system through this very large nerve in your body called the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve and other nerves. So yes, you. so this is what's happening. Um, and I'd say if kids are eating glyphosate enriched foods, I'd say just about all of them have leaky gut or intestinal permeability. Wow, sobering. That's so, great, Ste thank you. Stephanie, we're all exhibiting tremendous discipline here by not flooding our audience with 15 different studies and biochemical <laughs> pathways. So I'm gonna have you choose the juiciest one. Pick one, because we have to go on to some other diseases now. You know, I prepared yeah. for this. So pick a juicy uh, aspect of why GMOs and Roundup could be creating digestive disorders, including food allergies and sensitivities, if that's where you wanna go. Yeah, I think I'd like to talk about sulfur because I think that's quite interesting. A lot of, you're probably seeing a lot of kids that have sulfur sensitivities. And, um, and I think that's a direct hit from glyphosate. Glyphosate is a train wreck for the sulfur system, as I've seen. And it, it prevents the gut microbes from producing methionine from inorganic sulfur. It's been shown that glyphosate suppresses the enzyme that, that converts uh, sulfur, inorganic sulfur into organic sulfur in the form of this amino acid methionine, which is one of the critical, it's this, the core sulfur containing amino acid that is, it becomes cysteine and, and glutathione and, it, it, you know, it, and it eventually can be turned into sulfate. So the, um, the lack of the methionine, uh, of the ability to make a, among the gut microbes to make the methionine causes sulfur, uh, inorganic sulfur to get converted into, into hydrogen sulfide gas. And that's part of the bloating. And the hydrogen sulfide gas is very, very interesting because it can, um, it's very small, it's a gas. So it can just, it can move like a ghost through your tissues. It doesn't have to go in the blood or the lymph system, just moves like a ghost. And because it's lighter than air, it goes up to the brain. And so you get hydrogen sulfide gas in the brain, which causes brain fog. It's kind of like being in hibernation. It's really quite interesting. The hydrogen sulfide gets oxidized to sulfate in the brain. And that's a mechanism to supply sulfate to the brain, a really backdoor mechanism. Normally sulfate would be packaged up on top of serotonin molecules. So usually you're making lots of serotonin in the gut. The gut makes huge amounts of serotonin from those amino acids that are being suppressed by glyphosate. The serotonin gets a sulfate attached to it and gets shipped up to the brain. So the serotonin is really important for supplying sulfate to the brain. And when that system isn't working, the hydrogen sulfide gas actually can, can act as a backdoor to deliver sulfate 
to the brain in the form of hydrogen sulfide gas. You need oxidizing agents to turn hydrogen sulfide into sulfate. And that's why you get this inflammatory brain situation, this encephalopathy that's associated with autism and many other neurological diseases. That's helping to turn the hydrogen sulfide gas into sulfate. Um, so it really um, causes lots of weird problems, but are indirectly trying to solve a problem that which is the sulfate deficiency in the brain. That was amazing. We just covered like five symptoms <laughs> in one pathway. I'm, I'm kind of blown away. Before we get off of digestion, and there's so much more, I want to make sure that people realize it's not just Roundup, but there's a lot of evidence from GMOs generically. One of the first, well, the most in-depth animal feeding study ever done for years until the more recent uh, Seralini study was from Arpad Pustai, um, who is a close friend of mine now and not when he did the study. And he found that the process of genetic engineering, the generic process caused a potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract. It also caused smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partially at, partial atrophy of the liver and damaged immune system. But the, there's plenty of evidence showing that the process of genetic engineering, which creates the genetic engineered crops that we eat, the food that we eat, has this change in our physiology. And so when we are trying to avoid the, the bad actors, we want to avoid both GMOs and Roundup and one of the types of GMOs is called BT toxin mm. producing GMOs like the, so, the soy in, southern, in the southern, southern hemisphere and then the cotton and the corn in Northern hemisphere. It is designed to kill insects. And so there's an insecticide in the corn and the way it kills insects is it pokes holes in the walls of the intestine, of the gut, of the, of the gut, intestine of the, of the uh, we call it an intestine, the gut of the insect. But they found under high concentrations in a laboratory, it poked holes in human cells that look the exact same way. So talk, there's leaky gut between cells and there's leaky gut within cells. Mm. So glyphosate, we know, separates and BT toxin drills holes. <laughs> so you don't want to be eating GMOs with or without glyphosate. You don't want to be eating glyphosate with or without GMOs. And one way to do that is to eat organic. Before we get off the topic, is there anything else you wanna share with those suffering from digestive disorders or perhaps those treating them? Yeah, one more comment there, Jeffrey, just to tag on to what Stephanie said, what you said, and then I can make a comment, is that that reduction, what, what Stephanie is talking about is clinically very important because um, if you don't have enough sulfur and you can't make glutathione, and which is the master antioxidant, which prevents oxidative stress, which leads to all kinds of badness as like even cancers, is, is this reduction in glutathione. So we know that glyphosate-based herbicides reduce glutathione. We also know that GMOs from research in themselves reduce glutathione. Then you give a patient Tylenol, acetaminophen, mm. that reduces glutathione. So you've eliminated their key antioxidant physiologic powerhouse in their body. And any stressor that comes along where you need antioxidants, the patient is depleted. So I would say there are ways to offset, you've said it a million times, of course, the organic eating, but there are specific foods that you can eat that can also help you break down glyphosate. There are certain microbes, there aren't many, but there are few, and there's one in apple cider vinegar. Mm. It's called acetobacter. And there's one or two more, but that one at least is easy to get. It's relatively affordable. I make my own, if you can believe that. I've got little- mm, wow. little little mamas sitting in my, in my, my cupboard in there. Um, but you can buy it. It's relatively affordable. You put drink some in some water. It'll help you clear glyphosate um, from your body by breaking it down. You want to excrete it. You want to drink a lot of filtered water um, to excrete it. You want to help your kidneys because glyphosate-based herbicides are also kidney toxic. And we may cover that as well. Um, and that's what Dr. Pusti, my hero as well, showed. Um, as the liver and kidney, we'll talk about it, uh, toxicity. So that's what I just wanted to add. Beautiful. Excellent point. Yeah, excellent. Any point. closing comments, Stephanie? 
I will just chime in on the glutathione thing because that is something that I found was central. And I talk a lot about it in my book, starting with glutathione in the liver. The liver is the, is the detoxification center of the body. All the other toxic chemicals become a lot more toxic because the liver doesn't have the capacity to detoxify them. And, and it's been shown in multiple studies that glyphosate causes reduction in glutathione as well as increased in the ratio of oxidized to reduced glutathione, which indicates oxidative stress. It, glutathione needs to be reduced in order to work and glyphosate disrupts the system that reduces it. I talk about that in my book. And I will end up by saying this years ago, I was talking to a, some group of elite executives about GMOs and Roundup. And one said, you know, I had a very serious GI uh, procedure uh, a few years ago. And my GI doc said to me, I can tell you what caused your GI problem, which was serious but I can't write it down because it's too controversial. He said, what is it? He said, GMOs. Mm. So that was some years ago. Now there's enough evidence. So we hope that the GI docs will get the, the power and authority to say mm. to their patients, go organic. I and know, I'd that would be so great. To, and I'd love for them to share their information with the Institute for Responsible Technology. Thank you both. And thank you everyone for passing this on to everyone you know who might be suffering from a digestive disorder because this one short film, short video could save their life or their quality of life because we've seen it, we see it every day when people switch to organic. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about the next disease. <laughs> okay, the next disease, we, we have liver on our list, um, liver disease. I will start there by sharing my screen. Okay, our liver problems caused by GMOs and Roundup. So we have a lot of evidence, some evidence that's correlational and some that's um, plausible causative pathways. So we have liver and intrahepatic bile duct cancer incidents that went up from pretty um, aligned with the percentage of genetically engineered soy and crops in the United States and the amount of glyphosate, which is the chief poison in Roundup that sprayed on soy and corn, that, that as that went up, so too did this cancer. Here is a um, glyphosate applications to wheat, corn, and soy, because it's also sprayed on wheat just before harvest. You can see a correlation between the rate of liver cancer and the application of glyphosate. Um, there's also hepatitis C going up and we can talk about that as well. But let's now talk, are, do we see, Michelle Perro, in your, in your um, pediatric uh, program, do you see liver problems in children? Did they increase soon after GMOs and Roundup were on the scene and do they respond to a healthier diet? Um, yeah, this is interesting. And I've been kind of zeroing in on this because um, I've been tracking something called NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty mm. liver disease. And I've been tracking it adults and the, the it's, it's reached epidemic proportions of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The most common cause of fatty liver with where the, the liver is infiltrated by globs of fat. You should look at pictures of it. It's horrific to look at. The most common cause is alcohol. And this is non-alcoholic and, and we don't often find the reason for the fatty liver. The problem with this is it can go on to something called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, more serious, which can then go on to cirrhosis, where the liver is really non-functioning. It becomes fibrotic and yuggy. I mean, it's really, you should look at the visuals. Okay. Adults have about had a one in four, one in four Americans now has NAFLD. It's now one in three adults now has yeah. NAFLD. It's often, it's not often, it's majority of times silent and it cannot even be picked up on physical exam, just an ultrasound. Occasionally, you'll get a bump up in your liver enzymes, but not enough for the physician to cause concern. Now, in children, what's going on? 
In obese children, and obesity is now affecting anywhere from one in three to one in five children, depending on what state you live in. We have fatter states than others, but it's averaging, let's say 20, 25% of kids. In obese children, they have a higher rate of fatty liver and no one's looking at it. And they're also bumping up their liver enzymes. So we often don't do blood work in children because number one, it's a nightmare. You're sticking that needle in their little vein and they don't like it and the parents don't like it. But if you can get their blood you'll, and you do, do something called a metabolic panel and you check their liver function, their liver enzymes are going up abnormal. It says that they have liver cell injury. And if you look at all the usual possibilities, infection, most common, they don't have it. And you say, what else can be doing this? It's what environmental toxicants, which ones, pesticides, which one's the most common one, which is Roundup. And we'll go into what, how it, that happens. And I've read Stephanie's papers with an amazing explanation on how that actually happens. It's not being looked at by pediatricians. They're unaware. It's not even looking, being looked at by adults because you need to do ultrasounds. If their liver enzymes don't go up, we don't often do ultrasounds on kids or even adults for that matter. There are researchers now starting to look at this because in some parts of California in heavily sprayed pesticide regions, they're having an epidemic of obesity and liver disease. And clinicians have contacted me as well as researchers saying, we've got to study this. We're seeing now these enormous numbers of children who are then going to on to develop liver disease as adults. And as you heard, the first line of defense for detoxification against foreign substances, xenobiotics, are your gut microbiome. The second is your liver. You want to love your microbes, love your liver. You have mm -hmm. to protect that organ. And so um, it is a massive problem. I want to give the, uh, some of the evidence on the relationship of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to uh, Roundup and glyphosate. There was a research done in England, Dr. Michael Antonio and others, um, where he took uh, liver that had been from rats that had been fed tiny amounts of Roundup in the water for two years and found that beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Roundup caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. He, could, he did a molecular profiling. But he also pointed out that the amount of Roundup in the water was so small that the EPA allows the equivalent amount of glyphosate in our drinking water on a per body weight per consumption basis of 437,500 times more than was mm. fed to the rats. Wow. And that is on a per body weight per day basis. And so it's, it's uh, adjusted for the size of the rat. So the amount of glyphosate that's allowed in our water supply is beyond, but it's also in our water supply often, not, not, not consistently, but in some cases, but it's in the rain, it's in the food. And then there was study that came out this week not yet peer reviewed, but reported from Michael Antonio and others confirming once again, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and showing that Roundup altered the expression of 96 genes in the liver specifically linked to DNA damage and oxidative stress. So we have new evidence supporting this. And then finally, they took people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and tested the amount of glyphosate in their urine. And those that had higher levels of glyphosate had the, had the more dangerous and, and um, advanced form of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there's a lot of evidence that the one in three people in the United States having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease may be driven by the glyphosate in our food and in our water. Over to you, Stephanie. Wow, that's perfect, thank you. I talk about both of those papers in my book and I have a whole chapter on the liver in my book really fascinating what I found. And I, um, and as you pointed out, it's, there's evidence in from the mouse studies, rat studies, human studies that it's causing that. Um, I have, I think I found a critical answer for how that's happening. One, you know, one aspect of it, which is a specific enzyme called PEPCK, phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase. Very, very interesting because that enzyme uh, emulates EPSP synthase remarkably well. EPSP synthase is the enzyme in the shikimate pathway that glyphosate famously disrupts. This gets to be a little bit complicated, but it's extremely interesting to me and it's central actually 
to my book because it PEPCK is probably the best enzyme to illustrate the idea that I have that glyphosate is substituting for glycine. So the EPSP synthase has this place in the enzyme where it binds uh, a molecule called PEP and it binds, and at that place where it binds it, it has a glycine that has to be glycine. If that glycine is substituted for something else, it messes everything up, it doesn't work. And, and glyphosate disrupts, uh, suppresses the EPSP synthase, but if you have a version of the enzyme that has alanine instead of glycine, it has no effect. Glyphosate has no effect on that version of the enzyme. The easiest explanation is that glyphosate is actually going into the enzyme and replacing glycine at that spot. And it makes sense because glyphosate has this extra, glyphosate is a complete glycine molecule, except it has this extra stuff stuck on its nitrogen atom, which is called a methyl phosphonate unit. Methyl phosphonate is very similar in shape and, and characteristics to phosphate. And it, it, that glycine binds phosphate in PEP. And the place, so it needs to have room for the phosphate in the way the enzyme shapes up. But that also means it has room for the methyl phosphonate of glyphosate. So glyphosate goes in in place of glycine and occupies the space where the PEP is supposed to go. So PEP can't get in, the enzyme can't do its job. That's how it disrupts the PEP, the EPSP synthase in the gut. So the other enzyme, PEPC. Well, well, before you do that, let me, let me just translate a little of that science into a uh, vamp common vampire uh, series that we're seeing. Well, you know, when you're looking at a vampire movie or a witch movie, they're shapeshifters. And so, yes. you know, don't, don't pay attention to that guy. That's not the real guy, that's the shapeshifter. So you're saying basically that glyphosate is one of those uh, zombie shapeshifters that look like glycine. So then when they start sorting people, it says, okay, you over there, you over there, you over there. And everyone in the audience is saying, no, no, it's not really glycine. It's month. It's Monsanto's Roundup, it's glyphosate. And, and it gets put into the wrong area and then wreaks havoc. So this is a theory yes. that you have, you and Anthony Samsel have developed and you have developed it deeply in your book. And we're looking forward to more research to, to see if in fact we can nail that imposter. But I wanted to throw it back to you to give everyone an idea that what you're talking about is a shape-shifting glyphosate that pretends to be something that it's not, and then gets put into the wrong place and wreaks havoc. Yeah, and so the PE, so the PEPCK is a uh, also binds PEB, the same thing that that EPSP synthase binds, the same molecule. It also binds it at a place where it has actually it has more than one highly conserved glycine at that spot where it binds the PEP, and so it has the entirely same setup to be affected by glyphosate exactly the same way that EPSP synthase is affected. So if it's true that PEPCK gets suppressed by glyphosate, it, it results in a whole bunch of things that are going up in exact step with glyphosate. And certainly fatty liver disease is right, it hits hard on that. If, if PEPCK is deficient, you get fatty liver disease. So just that one enzyme alone could explain it. Glyphosate has also been shown to disrupt succinate dehydrogenase, which is a critical enzyme in the mitochondria that's related with the processing of um, turning food into energy, uh, ATP. So the mitochondria are really, really important for converting food into, into ATP, ATP, that's the energy resource for the cells. And succinate dehydrogenase is a big deal. It, it's really critical in that citric acid cycle. So glyphosate has been shown to suppress that enzyme. That's gonna wreck the citric acid cycle. That's also gonna uh, interfere with the uh, digestion of fats, with the processing of fats to produce energy. So you've got at least those two enzymes working against you in the liver. And then of course, you've got the oxidative damage that they've seen in multiple studies. They've shown that it dis disrupts DNA. It damages the DNA in the mitochondria, causes oxidative stress, ends up with the glutathione being oxidized. All of this has been seen in studies. So you see it both experimentally and theoretically, if you embrace the idea that it's disrupting the proteins. And, and by the way, the succinate dehydrogenase also has critical glycine dependencies that could be disrupted by glyphosate at phosphate binding sites. That's the pat pattern highly conserved glycine at a place that binds phosphate. That's the pattern that I see and I've gone through in my book and found all these enzymes that have that property and that are being affected by glyphosate. I wanna say, if you're watching Stephanie and you're not following everything that Stephanie says, you're probably not alone. You see, <laughs> Stephanie is, is an expert at processing data and patterns. You, mm -hmm. Stephanie, you are a, a PhD in, in, in a research scientist at MIT. You, are, you have developed methods for pulling down data off 
online and gathering and sorting huge amounts of data to look at patterns. And so you're going and finding the plausible causative pathways that no one else is paying attention to because everyone else is a scientist looking like this. And so you're, it's not like even many doctors would be able to know these metabolic pathways. And I would like to refer people, if you wanna dive in, to get Stephanie's book. It comes out in July. Please name the, the book. Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment. And that's summer 2021. And finally, before we get off the liver, we've been talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Is that so bad? What could that lead to, Michelle? Why do we want to prevent these bad things happening to our liver? What could, how could it hurt our quality of life or life as a whole? So yeah, um, protect the liver. There are several reasons because the liver is responsible as for detoxification, as, as we mentioned many times, but it also is involved with cholesterol synthesis, a storage of carbohydrates. It has uh, cleansing mechanisms or cleans out all red blood cells. So the liver has many functions. It's, it's, not, it's not just a, a detoxifier. And so as, as it gets kind of infiltrated with fat, uh, because of these processes that Stephanie described, it can't do its job and function. And so all these functions start to shift and you may see your inability to detoxify. All the phases of detoxif detoxification occur in the liver. You may see your inability, your cholesterol starts to eke up. You may also see that um, you cannot, um, you have problems with carbohydrate storage and you're always hungry because you have no carbohydrate storage. It releases um, various nutrition and various energy molecules when you need them. A lot of athletes like to load up with carbs, although they, they probably shouldn't, um, because then that's done by the liver. So that's what, and then eventually your liver will not function. And you could even eventually wind up with a liver transplant, hopefully not, which is a really kind of horrific endpoint. One more thing I want to mention that is so key with uh, glyphosate-based herbicides is that many of the enzymes that Stephanie's referring to require minerals as cofactors, um, like magnesium, like zinc. They're called cations, two plus cations. So glyphosate is a chelator. These enzymes are also impaired additionally to this beautiful explanation Stephanie gave, but they don't have the, their uh, cofactors. These mineral cofactors are called metals like magnesium and zinc. You require these various cofactors for anywhere from 200 to 300 reactions in the body and the brain is full of them. When you check patients and clients for their minerals, they're low. And you know mainstream physicians are checking the wrong thing. They'll check plasma levels of magnesium, for example, you're fine, plasma levels will be fine. They're not looking inside certain cells called red mm -hmm. blood cells. You see, so not only are, do you have the problem, you have your medical system that's ill-prepared to deal with the problem. And so there's just not enough nutrients in the food you're eating. There's not enough mineral to become cofactors. Magnesium, zinc, calcium, um, and there are, there are manganese, et cetera. Glyphosate loves manganese, and that's a very important um, mineral, uh, metal, um, copper, um, chromium for your thyroid function. I mean, and I mean for your pancreas function. Um, it goes on and on, Jeffrey. Um, all your organs require these metal cofactors. So chelation of minerals is key. So chelation is, I call it hugging, molecular hugging. Um, in fact, the first patent for glyphosate was as a descaler to clean off the, the metal, the mineral, uh, mineral buildup on industrial boilers and pipes. So because it, it grabs onto those minerals and strips them. So we had an image of glyphosate being a vampire, a shapeshifter. We now have an image of it wrapping around and covering with a sheet all of these minerals. So there's all these workers waiting for manganese to show up. They're on strike until manganese comes because nothing happens until manganese comes. And then all of a sudden glyphosate chelates, grabs the manganese, shows up, but no one knows that the manganese is there because it's absolutely unusable while it is bound with glyphosate. The other thing that you mentioned is that it, by glyphosate blocking the detoxification, it means all the other toxins that you're exposed to in life that are normally ushered out through the liver may not be, in which case 
It's like the king of the toxins. With glyphosate, it's like letting all of the bad guys out of the jail, right? You let, yeah. it's like all of a sudden now, all the different toxins are wreaking havoc in the body. They shouldn't be there. They should have been, they should have been exiled through the liver and not just through the liver, but there's a, a cellular detox pathway, NRD2, and that is also decreased because of glyphosate. That's not a published study. I'm not sure you're aware of it yet, but it shows that even on the cellular level, the ability to detox throughout the body is hampered. So as the king of the toxins, it allows all the bad guys to run rampant because it destroys the sheriff that was normally sending them out the liver. Okay, anything else we need to cover on liver before we go on to our next disease? Ready to move. <laughs> all right, ready to move. Okay, now this is gonna be fun. Okay, are neurological disorders caused by GMOs and Roundup? We're talking about autism, ADHD, processing disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, schizophrenia and other mental disorders, brain fog, mood anxiety, depression, suicide, memory and concentration. Here are some correlational charts that don't prove causation, but they're breathtaking. This was done in part by Stephanie Seneff and who's gonna be with us sharing the information on this. Autism prevalence at six years old, nearly a perfect correlation with the amount of glyphosate, the chief poison in Roundup, which is sprayed on our food. And this is a four year total exposure to glyphosate, a nearly perfect correlation with autism prevalence at six years old. Here is ADHD, again, correlated with the amount of glyphosate sprayed on soy and corn, very tight correlation. Here is Alzheimer deaths related to not only the amount of glyphosate sprayed on GMs on, on soy and corn, but the percentage of genetically engineered soy and corn as well. And here is hospital discharge of dementia, very closely correlated. Here is deaths from senile dementia, also closely correlated. And then Parkinson's disease, shows the correlation there. We have anxiety going up along with glyphosate spray, suicide by overdose also going up, and finally, schizophrenia. Now, all of these charts are breathtaking in their visual, but they don't prove anything on their own. It's just correlational. We're going to discuss causation. We're gonna discuss whether people are, are seeing it in their practices, seeing it in their lives. How can we know if GMOs and Roundup are causing this massive increase in these diseases? So I'm gonna start with you, Michelle. As a pediatrician for 40 years, you started working with kids long before GMOs and Roundup were introduced, and then GMOs and Roundup came on the scene. Did you see a change in neurocognitive dysfunction? Yes. And this is how I started getting, you know, in a kind of a hysteria when mm -hmm. it was early 2000s. And I would, well, I can say it's hysteria um, as I started seeing all these neurocognitive changes in kids and it wasn't subtle. This was not a subtle thing. And um, as I started tracking just autistic spectrum disorder, I'll just call it autism. And just every year, these striking jumps by the CDC, this wasn't the Journal of Juju Medicine, we were seeing these astronomical rises. Since the time that I wrote that book, which is a couple of years ago till now, the numbers have gone up even further of autism, where it's now affecting one in 23 boys, one in 58 kids, and you know, it varies a little bit, but I mean, there is a ratio of boys to girls, boys are more affected. So the numbers are still trending up. And all that, that whole kind of area of neurocognition um, from, you know, terms of sensory defensiveness and auditory processing and all these neurologic processing issues are all skyrocketing as well as ADHD is going up. It used to be 8%, 10% of kids. Now I just read it was 12% of children having trouble focusing. Now, we now have studies, Jeffrey, that, and, and Stephanie goes just further, that has show causation on how Roundup specifically through something called epoxide hydrolase specifically causes autism behaviors in rats. 
And the actual pathway in a study that came out in July of uh, 2020 showed the pathway. I was screaming from the rooftops, hey, everyone, this is a causation study. It's not a correlation study, it's causation, but I don't know. I don't, I don't, if everybody's in a state of fear and, and paralyzation from other uh, health issues affecting all of us right now, hard to say. So there is one other thing that literally makes me crazy. Glyphosate shuttles in aluminum into the brain, six different pathways on how glyphosate shuttles aluminum. It's, a, it's normally found in the earth, by the way, but your gut can clear it, except when you receive it in other formats. And this aluminum can cross with glyphosate across the blood brain barrier. Aluminum is a neurotoxin. It is linked to autism. It is linked to Alzheimer's. It is linked to de dementia. And there are studies that have shown aluminum in brains of patients who have suffered from those issues. So we are now, we, so we eat this compound which shuttles in aluminum, which causes autism. And we have an epidemic by the CDC classification. It's an epidemic of autism. And yet we're not removing the root cause, which I find shocking. When you, to treat autism is not just changing the diet. And Jeffrey, you and I have spoken about this. Stephanie, there are so many things you need to do. However, 90% of children on the autistic spectrum have gut issues and significant gut issues. So some people want to talk about acceptance of neurodiversity and being neuroatypical. We can have that conversation also, but there are health issues such as the gut and it's profound, and massive food intolerances, allergies, leaky gut, dysbiosis, nutrient deficiencies, you name it. How do we know? We check it. They have clinical manifestations. When you change your diet, even before you do anything else with the kids on the spectrum, they start to get better. They feel better. Their guts feel better. A significant proportion of them have constipation or diarrhea, or both. Um, so you can, And so you must change your diet. And a lot of these kids also have um, sensory defensiveness and they're picky eaters. It's a real challenge for families to do this, but you have to do it or they will not get better. And you have a window up until probably six years and then 12 years to reverse a lot of these neurocognitive um, abnormalities that these children face. Sorry for the long answer, but it really fires me up this, mm -hmm. this conversation. That was great, Thank Michelle. you. Thank you. Amazing. And, and we're going to talk about autism first, and then we're going to get into Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and dementia and brain fog and, and depression and anxiety, et cetera. So we're going to start with autism and then move into other areas. Um, I was talking to, uh, first of all, in the film Secret Ingredients, there are two autistic boys. The parents switch to organic food and the boys are no longer on the spectrum. Uh, Dr. Pearl, David Perlmutter, who's a, a friend and uh, he and I gave a lecture together and we talked about these neurocognitive disorders and he linked it to the aluminum that you mentioned, but also the gut bacteria and the overgrowth of clostridial species in the, in the gut bacteria. He said there's a fingerprint now for autistic children in the gut and it's clostridium, clostridial species in the gut. I remember talking to a veterinarian of large animals and he said that soon after Roundup Ready crops came on the market, cows had an overgrowth of Clostridium A. So he created a yogurt from healthy bacteria of certain uh, cows to feed to other cows. And he, he described the whole changes that were happening in the cows that were apparently happening in humans as well. Now, in our survey, we had 84 people who reported getting better from autism or their families or their patients when they switched to a non-GMO and largely organic diet. And 37% were significant improvement, 14% nearly gone and 7% complete recovery. Now that's a small sample size, but we've seen it. I've interviewed it, um, parents and we're not, as you say, we're not going to say just change the diet, talk to your doctor, et cetera. This is not um, advice for people in terms of medical advice. It is dietary advice, eat organic. Now, Stephanie, when, when you were at MIT, well, you're still at MIT, when you were studying and wanted to come up with what was causing autism, you pull down all the big data off the internet and you looked at all the different changes. And you told me 
you could understand based on the physiological changes of an autistic child, why they behaved that way, why they had their symptoms, but you couldn't figure out the environmental hit, hit that was causing them to have it. And you started pulling in all these different toxins and seeing if they were the answer, if they created that physiological footprint that caused the autism and nothing fit. There was no hand in glove until take it from there yeah so that was just a, really an epiphany for me it was such a moment in my life back in uh, september 2012 i was at a conference and i was giving a talk on statin drugs and uh and don huber was there giving a two-hour presentation on glyphosate i had never met don i didn't know who he was i didn't know what glyphosate was but i thought well this is a chemical i should probably attend this talk and see what he says and I was at, on the edge of my seat because he just described all these things that glyphosate does that were answers to my questions about why, my, why the autistic kids were having the problems they were having, the mineral problems, the, um, the gut dysbiosis, you know, and the um, liver issues. It was just like it just wrapped it all up in a package. And I was just so convinced. And then when I went back and found Nancy Swanson's data that showed perfect correlation, I mean, I was always trying to find correlation and go to see if I could find causation to go with it. And I was striking out. I had some sense that the vaccines were playing a role, but they were not. I knew they weren't the whole story. And I thought maybe antibiotics. I was kind of fussing around with a couple of things, but I felt very dissatisfied with what I had found and frustrated because I wasn't finding the answer. And th th this was just handed to me like a gift from God. I mean, it was just so amazing. It was very good timing. And I just took off with it. And I just went back and started reading everything I could about glyphosate. And it just became clearer and clearer. And luckily at that time too, was when Seralini's paper had just come out that showed low dose glyphosate over the lifespan caused all these problems in these rats. So I knew that glyphosate was not the safe chemical it was supposed to be, that there was reason to doubt that. And then to find, um, you know, since then, there's just been so many studies recently that have come out showing endocrine disruption, which is so crucial for development. Many, many papers are coming out left and right. You can't even keep up with them anymore. I keep getting, oh no, not another paper I have to read on glyphosate. You know, it's, really, it's exciting. I'm always so thrilled to see these. And as you said, uh, one of you said, I think this depression, you know, like the, the, exposing the, the dam to glyphosate during, during the pregnancy uh, can result in symptoms of, the, of autism, specifically autism and also depression in the offspring, just from the exposure in utero, forgetting about whatever they're getting after they're born. I mean, it's really, really striking. And, and I have, uh, uh, you know, many, many different pathways by which glyphosate causes autism. It's so fascinating. And the one you mentioned with the aluminum, I think is quite critical. And in fact, many of those plots that you showed of all those neurological diseases came from a paper that I wrote together with Nancy Swanson. And, um, and we, found, we, we found all those correlations and put them in the paper. And we also added um, sleep disorder. It was quite interesting. Uh, sleep disorder is going up very, very nicely and exactly in step with glyphosate usage. People are buying so many sleep medications these days and complaining about, I can't sleep. And that's connected to melatonin deficiency and that's connected to the pineal gland. And so we centered that paper on the pineal gland. I think it's in, it's in the title of the paper. Um, that glyphosate, we hypothesize that glyphosate is escorting aluminum, it's carrying aluminum past the gut barrier. And you don't even have to get past the brain barrier to get to the pineal gland. So it goes up into the brainstem and spreads the aluminum around. Once it gets into the acidic environment of the terminal watershed of the, of the circulation where the blood meets other fluids like the brain, the brain um, cerebral spinal fluid, because, you know, equilibrates with the blood. Those places have more acidic blood and acid drops allows glyphosate to drop off its, its weapon. So the glyphosate and the aluminum become freed up and both become toxic to the pineal gland, disrupting its ability to make uh, melatonin and to add sulfate to melatonin, which is very, very important for sleep because every melatonin molecule that's produced by the pineal gland is, is attached to sulfate before it's shipped into the cerebral spine, spinal fluid. And that melatonin sulfate is supplying sulfate to the brain in order to help it clear the garbage. And that's what you do when you sleep, you clear the garbage. And of course, um, you know, Alzheimer's is associated with garbage that can't be cleared, which is all this amyloid beta plaque. So I think that a critical issue with these neurological diseases is an impaired ability to, um, to clean up the mess that's caused by the oxidative damage because the brain has to use it has lots, it makes lots of energy and to make those neurons do their signaling, you have to produce a lot of oxidative stress and the brain needs to have an excellent antioxidant capacity to cope with it. And that's one thing that melatonin does fantastically well. Melatonin is a fantastic antioxidant. So without the melatonin, without the sulfate, 
um, the brain, you can't sleep. And then when you can't sleep, you have all these neurological disorders. There's a lot to unpack in what you said. I'm going to use it as a, as a segue to the other neurocognitive dysfunctions that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to start with the surveys that we did. I it was peer reviewed and published in the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine, where we surveyed 3,256 people who reported getting better from 28 different conditions. In the Alzheimer's or dementia category, there were 78 people that noted an improvement. About 30% had significant improvement, about 13 nearly gone, and 9% a complete recovery. We also had um, Parkinson's, uh, 44 people, and this was the, this, the, the lowest number of response of 28 different conditions was Parkinson's, 44 people, but 71% of those people reported was either significant, nearly gone, or completely recovered. Then we had anxiety and depression. We had, it was more than half of the people we, who submitted, it was um, 1,665 people reported getting better mm -hmm. from anxiety or depression or their mood disorders, and 71% were either significant improvement, nearly gone, or completely recovered. So we also have, we're going to put down fatigue and, and brain fog at the same time, even though fatigue is semi-related. That was the number two, 60 0.4% of all the people, 1,967 people reported getting better from fatigue and 71% it was either significant, nearly gone or completely recovered. And finally, brain fog, which is related to neurocognitive functioning. We had a tremendous number again. We had um, more than half of the people said they had improved in their brain fog and 68% had a either significant improvement, nearly gone or completely recovered. So. The, oh, last thing for the brain, for the brain, memory and concentration, 1,567 people. What was that? Oh yeah, 1,567 people got better from memory and 62% of them had either significant improvement, nearly gone or complete recovered and other mental disorders, it was 70% showed significant, nearly gone. So tremendous, tremendous numbers there when people switch from GMOs and Roundup laden diet to non-GMOs and Roundup based on reporting, based on reporting, which is not sufficient enough. Even with the correlation, it's not sufficient enough. But several of the biochemical pathways that you mentioned, Stephanie, really show what could be going on. I interviewed uh, Dr. David Perlmutter, who's also in the, my film Secret Ingredients, about these, and he talked about Alzheimer's and depression as inflammatory disorders. And he talked about how the, uh, Kieran talks about how, Kieran Christian, the expert in the microbiome, talks about how the LPS endotoxin can go through a leaky gut and end up causing plaque in the brain. So it comes down to leaky gut is related to Alzheimer's as well as dementia and Parkinson's. And we know that leaky gut can be created from Roundup and GMOs in very specific ways. So Michelle, when you're dealing with neurocognitive disorders in general, you mentioned autism. Do you have any insight from your experience and your research linking GMOs and Roundup to these other disorders? Um, yeah, in terms of, um, oh, for sure. Because what we talked about when I referred to earlier is that there's something called the gut-brain axis. So what happens to the gut happens to the brain. If the gut's inflamed, the brain's inflamed and vice versa. And there are significant, and your, and your gut is your second brain. There are significant neural um, pathways. There are a significant number of cells that communicate with your brain all the time. And half of what this happens also is through micro microbial metabolic products that also, which Kieran talks about, and these liposally, these LPSs, lipopolysaccharides, also go up into the brain. So what's happening is, um, you know, it, the way I see autistic spectrum conditions and other neurocognitive disorders is that they're basically autoimmune conditions um, that now we have chronic inflammation and this chronic inflammatory response is affecting the brain. And because of these various chemicals um, are causing an upregulation, um, increased immune cells being activated in the brain called microglial cells. So now you have the brain is inflamed, the brain is on fire. 
and that this inflamed brain to get those microglial cells to kind of turn down is really difficult. It's not so easy. Um, and this blood brain barrier is not impermeable to, to these toxins, they can cross. The other thing that I wanted to mention is how this ties into sleep, which is what Stephanie was talking about. Two thirds of children now under the age of 10 are reporting dysomnia, which are disturbances in sleep. Now, sleep, yeah, it's a great time for dreaming and how wonderful, but it's an, also a time where your glymphatics are at work. The glymphatics are your lymph system of your brain to clear out that to those toxic products. And I've seen great scans which show during sleep how active th these lymphatics are. So if you're not sleeping, you're not clearing out the toxic uh, debris from your very active tissue, which is the brain. So, um, so the idea is when we treat these neurocognitive disorders, the first place I start as per Hippocrates is the gut. And as I work on the gut, I heal intestinal permeability leaky gut, rebalance the microbiota, replace nutrient deficiencies like the metals that are chelated by glyphosate. Of course, this is all on organic diet. Repair the damages done to the nervous system via the uh, fatty acids that you need and the various phospholipids to repair the nervous system so it can do its job, which is simply neurologic conduction. So your nervous system can do impulses, which is via these various minerals in certain concentrations. And then of course, remove any other offending agents. And if you follow that simple A to E procedure, offending agent, other toxicants were loaded, whether it's air pollution, et cetera, chronic infections. A lot of kids are experiencing other diseases called pandas and other stuff, which I don't think we need to go into right now. And then you remove the offending agents. And this process is reversible. Remember the brain is plastic. It has a plasticity. It's not set in stone. And the younger you start, the better off the child. But I also believe older individuals well can have the brain can remodel itself. So this idea of that these nervous cells, these dendri dendritic cells can do a lot of pruning and cleaning up. So it's not just a one way street, like once you're there, you're done. If the earlier you, you act, the better. But when we do this process, you can reverse a lot of these chronic neurologic diseases, which greatly impair someone's quality of life. I'm gonna to add two things to the discussion. One is the mitochondrial dysfunction or the toxicity of Roundup to mitochondria and also the happy neurotransmitter, serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine in terms of its how it gets produced. So I remember in the movie, uh, Secret Ingredients, David Perlmutter talked about how the, the brain is just 5% of the body weight, but it uses at rest 25% of the energy and that uh, there were so many people that report getting better from brain fog by switching to an organic diet. He said, yeah, the mitochondria is what drives that energy. And so a lot of times the, the mitochondrial uh, health is related to these cognitive disorders. If you don't have the energy, you don't have the, the ability to function properly. But then there's also the serotonin, dopamine and, dopamine and melatonin. These are critical for brain function. We've already mentioned melatonin and also melatonin for sleep. Well, the way that we create them, we rely on the gut bacteria to produce the precursors, which is tyrosine and L-tryptophan. And that method by which it bakes those, those ingredients to hand off to the next chef, which then produces the serotonin and dopamine and then goes up to the pineal gland and becomes melatonin, that, that's blocked by glyphosate. It's been verified to be blocked in rat studies. And that means that there may not be enough of the ingredients. And so they have to take it off the menu. So if you don't have enough serotonin, you don't have, and serotonin gets converted to melatonin, you may not have enough melatonin to sleep. That governs your circadian rhythms. Not to mention the pineal glands messing up because of the aluminum, which is something that you're teaching everyone, Stephanie. So mm -hmm. these are basic understandings. You, don't, you want your serotonin, you want your dopamine, you want your melatonin in good amounts. You don't wanna run out and take it off the menu. You want the energy. And we have evidence that glyphosate damages these things. Now, Stephanie, I know you've been chopping at the bit because you understand neurochemical pathways that no one has discovered yet that mm -hmm. relate to, from glyphosate to the brain. Why don't you uh, share some of the information that you've learned? 
you know, it's hard to know where to start, but it is interesting. And I hadn't realized until, you know, quite a while after looking into things that melatonin is actually also mostly produced in the gut. The, 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 the pineal gland makes melatonin in the evening when you get the sunlight, but the gut is making a lot more melatonin. So both the serotonin and the melatonin are produced in the gut in large amounts. And then they're sulfated and then they're shipped to the brain. So again, that's supplying that sulfate. And in fact, really interesting with autism, I found both in mouse studies and in human studies, um, autism is associated with a uh, severe depletion in heparin sulfate in the, in the brain ventricles inside the, the, those tubes that have the liquid, the cerebral spinal fluid inside the brain, which is where the, you know, the, uh, the pineal gland releases its melatonin into the brain ventricles that, that, that and then can cart that, it around to the various neurons through the cerebral spinal fluid. So the um, sulfate is deficient in the brain ventricles. And I think in part because these transporters are messed up, the melatonin and the serotonin are not supplying sulfate and heparin sulfate deficiency was post-mortem studies of, of human autism brains showed heparin sulfate deficiency in the, in the brain ventricles. And there was a mouse study where they had a specific defect that they introduced through technology after the mice were born. They were fine. They had no you know, genetic problems, but they introduced this, this toxin that interfered with their ability to make heparin sulfate in the brain ventricles. And, the, and they reproduced all the mouse versions of autism just with that one change. So that's very central to autism. And, it, and also there were mice that had been, um, there were mice that had been bred to have autism. They used them in autism studies. And those mice were also shown to have heparin sulfate deficiency in the brain ventricle. So I think that's a central feature of autism. And it also speaks to the fact that sulfate is deficient in the brain. And that also explains why, why the hydrogen sulfide gas, you know, this whole mechanism of letting the gas uh, come up to the brain from the gut because, of, because the glyphosate is disrupting the ability to make the sulfate or to make the methionine, both ways actually are messed up. So you get the sulfide getting converted to hydrogen sulfide gas in the gut, which it gives you the bloating. And then the hydrogen sulfide gas just sort of works its way up to your brain, gets oxidized there. The, the brain is like, fantastic, I've got some sulfur, I can make some sulfate, but that's really bad because it has to use oxidizing agents to do that. And so that's when you get oxidative damage from the efforts that the brain has to use to make its own sulfate because it's not being delivered. This is what I think is going on with autism. And so and, it's helping the autism in terms of producing sulfate, but at the same time, it's causing oxidative damage. May I add something there is something very important that you said is, Jeffrey, if I just jump in there, that heparin sulfate is key. It's also one of the key ingredients to something called the extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm. There are two products in there that no, uh, mainstream medicine never talks about. So between all your cells, you have a matrix and these cells communicate via this matrix. And this extracellular matrix is a very, it's similar to the backbone of a plant and it, it has a structure and heparin sulfate is a key part of it and chondroitin sulfate. So when you're deficient in these sulfates, that is where often um, uh, various toxins and toxicants are stored. So if it's deficient, the extracellular matrix can hold on to these toxicants. And also what's affected is communication between cells and transport between cells. So this matrix dysfunction is also affected and cells can therefore cannot do their work. So it, what Stephanie, what you're talking about is actually in my opinion as well, spot on. I want, to add, yeah. I want to add a study, which I don't believe is published yet, where they put glyphosate in cells and checked the gap junctions. The gap junctions are how cells communicate with each other. These are different than the tight junctions or the gap junctions. And I think it was it dropped by about 50%. Yes, and that's right. huge. That's huge. And that's linked to cancer because cancer, obviously, when you have individual cells that are, that are isolated, that are not communicating, then they can grow uh, astronomically and become tumors, et cetera. So they find a relationship between gap junctions and cancer, and there's a relationship between glyphosate and the, the reduction in gap junction activity. So the ability for cells to talk to each other. And I'm sure that has something to do with the brain physiology as well. And it's interesting, um, there's something that is just anecdotal or it's, it's, it's experimental, but I don't understand how it might affect the neurocognitive development. Um, they found in the blood of pregnant women in Canada, 93% of them had BT toxin in their blood, and it was an 80% of their unborn fetuses. There was also Roundup in the cord blood in the unborn fetuses. There's no blood brain barrier to keep it out of the brain, so it can go into the brain. You've talked all about what can happen with glyphosate. We have, we have 
we're marinating the brains of the children in glyphosate in the womb, horrible concept. But there's also the Bt toxin. We know that the Bt toxin not only provokes an immune response, but it also pokes holes in human cells at high concentration. So we have a hole poking toxin in mm -hmm. the brain of the offspring of this generation. No one has looked at that. I just raise it as an issue that needs to be looked at and it's a scary idea. All right, so before we get off of neurocognitive dysfunction, is there anything else you wanna to say to those suffering from, with friends that have it, or those that treat it? I think we did a good job kind okay. of <laughs> that yeah. subject up. There's always more to say, but it can wait until the next time. <laughs> All right, very good. So now we're gonna go on to another serious set of diseases. Are autoimmune diseases caused by GMOs and Roundup? We're talking type one diabetes, uh, JRA, Hashimoto's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, and celiac. Okay, we're gonna just look at one chart for that, and that is celiac disease. This is created by Stephanie Seneff. Uh, I believe you, you worked on this, and it's the amount of glyphosate on wheat. Glyphosate is the chief poison in Roundup. It is sprayed on wheat three to five days before harvest to speed up the harvest, et cetera. And it is correlated to celiac disease. That doesn't mean causation, but we will discuss it and other autoimmune diseases now. Let's start with you, Michelle Perro, as a pediatrician. Have you seen an increase in autoimmune diseases since you started, since GMOs and Roundup were introduced into the food supply in the late 1990s? Shocking, shocking number. Um, Hashimoto's disease in nine-year-old boys, 18-month-old with ulcerative colitis, um, type one diabetes um, on the rise, um, uh, ju juvenile, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis on the rise. And um, yes, across the board, autoimmune diseases are, are rising, they're debilitating, they're even in our integrated medical world, not easy to fix, by the way. Um, and they, um, you know, and we actually, and the celiac thing is, because I've read Dr. Perlmutter, I'm a fan, um, you know, I said, is it the gluten? Is it the glyphosate? Is it both? Is it the leaky gut, the dysbiosis, the gluten and the glyphosate? I've gone around and around trying to figure out what's causing this rise in wheat intolerance and celiac disease. Wheat intolerance is not celiac disease. Celiac is a, a serious autoimmune disease associated with a lot of other autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases can then lead on to genotoxic diseases like cancer. By the way, autoimmune disease is not benign. Even there are some now considering asthma as an autoimmune disease. And as I previously mentioned, I consider autism an autoimmune disease. And one of the best papers I read about celiac disease, so much from uh, Dr. Fasano, of course, um, from Harvard, um, was about fish. Hmm. That they can induce celiac disease in fish when they expose them to glyphosate. Hmm. And what they found in these fish who developed celiac disease was an imbalance in the gut bacteria, impairment detoxification, and mineral deficiencies. And I was like, oh, all, <laughs> oh, all the things that glyphosate causes. So we can induce this disease in other animals. Uh, fish are not known to get celiac disease, by the way. I don't believe they eat, you know, Italian bread, you know, with their main meal. So, um, so yes, of course, the board and um, and it's challenging. And these kids often have a life of pharmaceutical intervention and a lot of health complaints. Their lives definitely lose, they definitely have a decreased quality of life, uh, kids with autoimmune disease. And I, I've just gotten one horrific letter from a, um, a colleague saying, oh my God, you've got to treat this kid with Crohn's disease, he's 10 years old and he's literally mm -hmm. dying. So mm -hmm. I am not trivializing you know, the effects from these chronic in, um, autoimmune conditions. I want to introduce the leaky gut link to autoimmune disease, uh, which is well known, but I'll do it in a way that I think most people can understand. Uh, when you put Roundup into the food and you put it, expose it to the, to the gut, it is very likely that it is causing leaky gut because we see that in a Petri dish and it is, we see it clinically. And it opens up and allows undigested proteins to lumber into 
uh, areas that it's not supposed to go. And so the immune system looks, oh my God, they're there. And the modern immune system, they take out their iPhones and take pictures of these, <laughs> these intruders and post it on their, their Facebook pages. And then all of the, everyone, who, all the different immune systems go after it. But you see, it's a little bit pixelated and it's not hard to see. It's not hard to, to it's not hard to, it's hard to see. So they start going after anything that looks like that, which could be the, the gut walls. It could be the, the uh, thyroid. So they start attacking things that look like this picture. And that's autoimmune disease, basically, where you have leaky gut, then you have these intruders, then the immune system attacks, they take a picture of it, they circulate the picture for the most, most wanted, it gets mistaken through molecular mimicry, and now they're attacking the actual human body. So I wanted to put that as a basic concept for autoimmune disease. It's based on old iPhones. Uh, and bad, you know, bad uh, pixelations. So Stephanie, why don't you talk about what you've discovered and what you share in your book? Please name your book as well. Uh, mm -hmm. What you share in your book about how Roundup and glyphosate, its chief poison, are linked to autoimmune disease. Yes, I have a chapter devoted to that topic and uh, the immune system in general, and then autoimmune disease in particular. And um, and what I found was really quite interesting. And you said it all correctly about these. Um, antibodies becoming have, getting nearsighted and not recognizing quite the right thing and then attacking the human uh, cells, for example, myelin sheath, you know, there's, a, they can in, end up attacking the myelin sheath and causing multiple sclerosis, for example, and that's another autoimmune disease and lupus is another one. And of course you have celiac and asthma and eczema. And as you mentioned, autism, I think that many of these diseases have an autoimmune component to them. Um, and, it, and it's all tied to this overzealous uh, adaptive immune system. And that's partly because these underdigested protein, proteins are floating around. But also, I think two other things. One is that glyphosate is getting into human proteins and messing them up. And so one really fascinating thing that I discovered as I was reading about these proteins is that um, transglutaminase is a protein that's connected to celiac disease, autoimmune attack on transglutaminase. And transglutaminase is an interesting protein because it, it, when it gets released, it, it sticks to the extracellular matrix, those heparin sulfate proteoglycans that I mentioned, that you've mentioned. The, uh, it sticks there, it stays in the membrane of the cell. However, the, uh, the part of the molecule that sticks to heparin sulfate has, this, has a glycine problem that it can get substituted by glyphosate and then it won't stick. So it wanders out into the general circulation instead of sticking where it's supposed to do its effect. It can, have, it can be controlled by sticking to the heparin sulfate, but if it gets loose, then it becomes exposed. Parts of that protein become exposed to the immune system that would not normally be exposed. And then you get those antibodies attacking it. So it's very, very interesting to think about human proteins can become allergenic in part because they've got glyphosate in them. They don't look correct anymore. They don't fold correctly. They don't attach where they should, they get loose. I mean, all these things happen that can cause the immune system to start attacking human proteins that have been disrupted by glyphosate. I believe that that is part of what's going on. And um, so and then, and the innate immune system is also disrupted by glyphosate. If you believe my theory, there's a, a whole bunch of proteins that I talk about in my book that have these glycine sensitivity situations where they can get disrupted by glyphosate. Um, and in particular, uh, collagen is an important one to mention because collagen has long, long swaths of GXY, 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 where every third amino acid is a glycine. And that's crucial for the way collagen folds. It, it forms this beautiful triple helix. It holds water. It has good structural integrity and flexibility. It has all the proper things you need to make the joints work correctly, the bones. You know, it, it, there's lots of collagen in the skin, everywhere in the body. It's the most common protein in the body and has all this glycine in it. So it has lots and lots of vulnerability for glyphosate substitution to mess it up. And um, the collagen, a collagen-like um, protein, there's a whole class of collagen-like proteins that have collagen stalks on them that are part of the innate immune system. There's a whole bunch of them. There's several of them in the, there's these surfactant proteins in the lungs that, um, that have these collagen stalks. And, and those proteins are very good at being like vacuum cleaners. They go around and find trouble. They, they, they attach to these um, mo molecules that need to be cleared and they carry them home to the immune cell so they can be removed. And those, those proteins are gonna be thoroughly disrupted by glyphosate, I suspect, 
messing up the innate immune system, which then means that the adaptive immune system has to play a bigger role. So you have all these wavered pro proteins floating around causing trouble. And then you have this innate immune system that can't find them because of the, nor the normal mechanism for, uh, for cleaning them up is broken by glyphosate. And so then the adaptive immune system has to come into play. And that's when you get the reaction, you know, the release of all these cytokines that uh, are reactive um, molecules, it's signaling molecules that create this reactive cascade that causes all this collateral damage of the tissue. So you get destruction of the lungs, for example, because uh, when you have an infection, because the innate immune system is unable to clear the infection because it's been weakened so much by glyphosate. That, that is very intricate biochemistry, but what plays out in terms of people's experience as well is significant, significant improvements in autoimmune disease that may help prove the principle of what you're saying. We, we uh, surveyed people who got better from autoimmune disease, 696 people, and 99.2 said mild improvement. Moderate improvement, 21%, but 40% had significant improvement. 18.4 had nearly gone and about 12% were completely recovered. Wow. And then within gluten sensitivity, which includes celiac, so it's a combination of the two. So it's hard to know whether it's the autoimmune or version or the uh, sensitivity version. There was 1,375 people reported getting better from gluten sensitivity, and 76% of those were either significant improvement, nearly gone, or completely recovered. Michelle, do you want to add anything to the autoimmune disease discussion for those that suffer or treat autoimmune disease? Yeah, so um, anything that we can do to reduce the state of chronic inflammation is worth pursuing because when you, we're all in this state of chronic inflammation and all that means is that our, our immune systems are activated, they're turned on. And what Stephanie's referring to is this, not only is your innate immunity uh, turned on, but your adaptive immunity. That, those are your immunoglobulins. They're the focused ones. Your innate immunity is your first line of attack. Your adaptive immune system, you have to, where you produce immunoglobulins, which are specifically directed to various things, even like gluten, uh, specific viruses, specific bacteria they're upregulated, they're turned on. So you want to create immunologic harmony in your body, in your balance. And so when, so to quiet autoimmunity, you want to regain gut function, heal the le leaky gut. Remember 80, 70 to 80% of your immune function comes from your microbiome. Um, it's made um, in your gut rather, not by your microbiome, pardon, but in your gut. So anything that heals your gut will improve your immune function by putting it in balance. There are various cells that work in harmony. If some are too high, it can lead to allergy. If some are too high, it can lead to autoimmunity. So we wanna recreate balance. We are a society, Americans are out of balance because of our sad diet. So this, by just re-regulating gut function, your autoimmunity will likely get better. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't put a shout out to kids who suffer from PANDAS, pediatric acute neuropsychiatric disorder. Adults often have PANS. Um, it's not all just kids. Where because there's because of this autoimmune from strep induced, they have um, attack against their nervous system. We're seeing an epidemic now of kids with PANDAS. I don't believe it's just strep. I believe it's a, just this chronic inflammatory state that we're now dealing with. And even as we deal with chronic infections, whether it's COVID or others, you're already upregulated. So that is not necessarily a better immune function when you have an activated immune system, because then your soldiers are constantly turned on. You wanna keep it at bay and call them to the, to the front line when needed, not chronically fighting. To run your immune system takes a lot of ATPs. It takes a lot of energy. So when people are chronically activated, like autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, they're fatigued because it's using a lot of energy to run that system. So you want to decrease the battery usage. Beautiful. Shall we go on to the next disease? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, We talked about this a bit, but we're going to do it in a more complete way. Are sleep disorders caused by GMOs and Roundup? We have correlational evidence showing hospital discharges of insomnia go up in a correlated way 
with the total amount of glyphosate, the chief poison in Roundup, sprayed on corn and soy. We also have general sleep disorders also going up in parallel. I'm gonna turn over the screen to you, Michelle, so you can share some of the experiences you had with sleep disorders. Yeah, you know, um, as I already mentioned about children, um, insomnia is a, an incredibly common complaint among adults. I already spoke to you about insomnia in kids and insomnia. And um, in a lot of um, these neurotransmitters that are calming are out of balance. So kids have too many um, activity promoking, hyper driving um, neurotransmitters and not of enough of the calming ones like serotonin. And we know that these, the precursors to making these, um, these uh, chemicals that um, help sleep are decreased or diminished even, such as serotonin, and that is affected by the shikimate pathway that Stephanie referred to earlier. So um, I would say that, um, yes, we have deficiencies in serotonin. Yes, it's driven by diet. Yes, we don't have enough calming neurotransmitters to induce sleep. We often use things like 5-HTP or tryptophan, or we give melatonin. We can talk about melatonin. I don't like them as long-term solutions. I often use them as short-term solutions um, in dealing uh, with insomnias. And I also have parents as well as adults turn off the Wi-Fi. It's, it's multimodal, it's diet and others. Um, I don't wanna create a conversation here around Wi-Fi and electromagnetic frequencies, but it's part of the equation. Um, and also um, your microbes also uh, chat with each other through electromagnetic frequencies. It's all linked, Jeffrey. Uh, so um, I think, again, it's related to glyphosate, uh, neurotransmitter serotonin, decrease in melatonin, and this balance of neurotransmitters, which are made in the gut. Your brain also makes serotonin, by the way, um, and that could be affected by some of the other things we talked about, um, and like, uh, oh my gosh, uh, activation of all the neural cells, et cetera. I'm gonna add what Kieran Christian, the microbiome expert talked about. He said that when the microbial diversity goes down, which it does when you expose the human microbiome to glyphosate and Roundup, then you negate the production of GABA, which is, and also BN, BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And they're really important to, they upregulate the parasympathetic nervous system and shut down the brain, making it able to sleep. But if you don't do that, then you're producing stress hormones instead, which is exactly the opposite that you want to, to accomplish uh, by having, and this is just a microbiome uh, view of the world, because Kieran looks at the world through the microbiome in a beautiful way. How would you like to contribute to, because you did, you did those um, correlational studies with Nancy Swanson, mm -hmm. you did look at that. What do you think, how can you add some of the uh, biochemical pathways and physiological changes that you think glyphosate is causing that results in lack of sleep? Yes, and I mentioned the aluminum problem before where glyphosate escorts aluminum into the, into the brain and gets it into the pineal gland, which disrupts its ability, um, harms it. And then there's also a sulfate problem with the uh, pineal gland. I believe that um, sunlight exposure to the eyes, so sunlight exposure to the skin induces cholesterol sulfate synthesis in the skin. Cholesterol sulfate is a molecule we didn't talk about, but it's extremely important, I think, and I think it's disrupted by glyphosate. And that's a reason why we have high serum LDL, which is also uh, going up in step with glyphosate uh, the, that gets you on a statin drug. I got a little bit off track there, but um, cholesterol sulfate in the eye. So when your eyes are, so in the morning, it's really important to get out and get that sunlight exposure to your, to your eyes. And that will induce the synthesis of sulfate, heparin sulfate actually by the pineal gland. And then that heparin sulfate, the pineal gland uses that heparin sulfate to supply sulfate and it ships out melatonin to the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So it, it, it attaches sulfate to the melatonin and ships it out to the cerebral spinal fluid. And then it's therefore supplying both the melatonin and the sulfate to the brain to help the sleep. And th they're both very, very critical for the sleep process. So both the sulfation process is disrupted by glyphosate because the enzyme that does that is, a, is an orphan type enzyme. It's called ENOS and I've written a lot about it. I think it's getting disrupted by glyphosate, which is interfering with the ability to, to, to maintain adequate sulfate. And the enzymes that uh, activate the sulfate and that transfer the sulfate, they're all disrupted by glyphosate. So you get a, 
huge problem with sulfate deficiency in the brain, as I mentioned earlier, which interferes with sleep in, as well as interfering as causing all these uh, neurological diseases. Uh, so it's the aluminum, the lack of sunlight, um, exposure to the eyes. And I actually feel very upset when I see a child wearing sunglasses. I think that's criminal. I really think this, the children need to receive sunlight into the eyes to help to maintain the sulfate supply for the pineal gland. Uh, I wanted to know how long it takes switching to an organic or non-GMO diet to help the sleep patterns. Now, I know from my own surveys, 1,082 people reported getting better from insomnia specifically, and 65% uh, of them said it was either significant, nearly gone, or completely, completely handled. But from a clinical standpoint, Michelle, and I know you deal mostly with children, so it may not relate to adults, how quickly does a switch to organic diet result in better sleep? You know, it's pretty rapid. Um, it's not, you know, the gut can take a while to heal. Um, I've seen, you know, at, because a lot of these sleep disorders are linked to other disorders. And when you switch an or organic diet, you're fixing a lot of things at once, particularly gut function, and then sleep improves. So there are a lot of things that are linked. So it's hard to delineate just sleep because often the patients I see just don't have a sleep disorder. It's more than one thing. They have several issues going on, especially when you ask them. Sometimes people don't realize even they have other issues going on because uh, sick is the new normal. And it's like, oh, everybody has allergies. Doesn't everybody have asthma? Doesn't everybody have? And no, everyone doesn't. But actually it can happen pretty quickly. People start to say, wow, I had a good night's sleep last night when I changed my diet. Now people will say that with alcohol, for example. So they realize when they drink a toxic substance it affects their sleep. When you eat a toxic substance, it will affect your sleep. So this idea, alcohol is a toxin, okay? Let's be clear. It's good, but it's a toxin. Um, <laughs> glyphosate is a toxin, not so good. So it can happen quickly. So we have to keep drilling in this idea that we have chronic poisoning, low dose poisoning, in some cases not so low dose, from glyphosate. We are being daily poisoned. And when you remove the poison, um, I've seen sleep improve with quickly in a couple of days. So All right, we're going to leave it there. We're going to leave it there because we're out of time. I want to thank you, Michelle and Stephanie. As I'm telling the audience, we've never done this before. No one has done this before where we look at all of these components on a per disease basis. When you receive these cut up sections of this talk, when it's per disease, please share it widely in your social media because we want this to get traction. We want the people suffering from these diseases to know the relationship between their disease, GMOs and Roundup and the, the importance of eating organic. And you can have a strong, take a strong position to help that get out by sharing this over and over again. And thank you both, Michelle and Stephanie, and thank you, Real Truth About Health. Uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Michelle and Stephanie, this has been, I mean, how disturbing and frightening and alarming. And on the other hand, how privileged and filled with gratitude we all are that you came together to do this unprecedented uh, uh, presentation. This has been phenomenal for all of us. Um, obviously we won't get, we don't have time for a Q and A, but it was so worth it to have all of you join in and empower the rest of us. So thank you, thank you so much to all of us, uh, to all of you rather. And, um, want to make sure that everybody knows to keep coming back for more. And is there anywhere else you guys want to share about where each individually, everybody can find you? Where's, where's the best website to go to? Stephanie, why don't you start then Michelle? Um, StephanieSenef.net is my new website that where I talk about my book and have some other things there too. And, and also I have my MIT website, which is, um, which is, uh, this is a StephanieSenef.net. And then there's a C-Cell MIT website that you can find if you, uh, Google me or something. <laughs> so, oh, there you go. You got the other one there too. So there's two of them. One of them, this one has lots and lots of uh, information while my papers and my slide decks, I, I have a lot of my slides. These slides are available on my website at MIT, this ccl.mit.edu slash Senate. Michelle? Um, starting on July 1st, I am starting a new website, drmichellepero.com, no period after doctor. And I'm going to be doing weekly Zooms teaching parents um, specifically on integrative pediatrics, because it's really hard to find integrative pediatricians who practice, 
practice holistically um, and there will be a membership. I'm not turning anybody away for lack of ability to pay. This is to get the word out there on how to empower parents to care for their own children and to teach how the body has an innate ability to heal itself. And GMOScience.org, an amazing source. Michelle is the executive director of GMOScience.org. And I am the executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology. And you can also go to livehealthybewell.com to catch my podcast, to catch, to catch the secret ingredients movie at livehealthybewell.com. Also, Healing from GMOs and Roundup, an online course, and which Michelle has been interviewed for, as well as the 90-day lifestyle upgrade, how to help you adapt an organic diet very quickly with less cost and less time. But the mothership, the mothership uh, website is responsibletechnology.org. And once again, thank you for real truth about health, for giving us an opportunity to come together to share all this information and mix and match in ways that have never been done before. Uh, the, the thanks goes to the three of you, and we just could not be more appreciative. I'd love to thank you up and down all day myself, but I'm looking in the chat box and people are calling you heroes. And you are, you're incredible advocates and you're fighting the good fight for us. And I gotta tell you, being that I'm not the only one that wants to say thanks, let's hear it from everybody. What do you say, everybody? Thank you so much. You're all amazing, thank you. 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 Thank you.